At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time, but once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion, and if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice, or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us, so that in the service time, when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. All right, well, we are moving into the book of Jeremiah today, so I'm about to show you a video which I will call the fire hose of information. So open wide. Here we go. You ready? Let's do this. The book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Jerusalem during the final decades of the kingdom of southern Judah. He was called as a prophet to warn Israel about the severe consequences of breaking their covenant with God through their idolatry and injustice, and he even predicted that the empire of Babylon would come as God's servant to bring this judgment on Israel by destroying Jerusalem and taking the people into exile. And sadly, his words became reality. Jeremiah lived through the siege and destruction of Jerusalem and witnessed the exile personally. Now this book came into existence in a really interesting way. Chapter 36 tells us that after 20 years of Jeremiah's preaching in Jerusalem, God called him to collect all of his sermons and poems and essays and commit them to writing, which Jeremiah did by employing a scribe named Baruch, who wrote down and compiled all of this material into a scroll. Now Baruch also gathered lots of stories about Jeremiah, and he linked all the pieces together. And so this is why the book reads like an anthology, a collection of collections. It's all been arranged to present this prophet as a messenger of God's justice and grace. So the book begins with God calling Jeremiah to be a prophet, and he's given a dual vocation. He will be a prophet to Israel, but also to the nations. And his words will both uproot and tear down, but also plant and build up. In other words, he's going to accuse Israel and warn them of God's coming judgment, but he also has a message of hope for the future. Now this opening perfectly summarizes the first large section, chapters 1 to 24. It's a collection of Jeremiah's writings from before the exile. And the core idea here is that Israel has broken the covenant with God and violated all the terms of the agreement they made that are written in the Torah, and in a number of ways. They've adopted the worship of all kinds of Canaanite gods, building idol shrines all over the land, and Jeremiah develops the metaphor of idolatry as adultery, and uses the language of prostitution, promiscuity, unfaithfulness to describe how Israel has given their allegiance to other gods. Jeremiah also repeatedly accuses Israel's leaders. The priests, the kings, the other prophets have all become corrupt. They've abandoned the Torah and the covenant, which has led to a tragic result, rampant social injustice. The most vulnerable people in Israelite communities, the widows, the orphans, the immigrants, were all being taken advantage of in clear violation of the laws of the Torah. And Israel's leaders didn't even seem to care. So a classic place where all of these ideas come together is in chapter 7. It's called Jeremiah's Temple Sermon. The Israelites are coming to worship their God in the temple as if everything is just fine. But outside the temple, they are worshiping other gods. And some were even adopting the horrifying Canaanite practice of child sacrifice. And so Jeremiah makes his very unpopular announcement. The God of Israel is coming in judgment. He's going to destroy his own temple and punish Israel by sending an enemy from the north. This is an army that God would allow to conquer Jerusalem. And as you read on, you discover he's talking about the great empire of Babylon. Okay, breathe. And that's it. Thanks for coming today. Want to go home? Uh, Read chapters 1 through 24 all week long and then come back next week and we'll see what you found out. So uh, a lot of information that is presented right there. We're going to spend today just sort of slowing that down a little bit, but it's it's an important picture for you to get that there's a lot that happens in the book of Jeremiah. So our goal today is hopefully, one, to have you familiar with Jeremiah. And let's get it out of the open right now for those of you who are singing in your head, Jeremiah was not a bullfrog, okay? (laughs) Done. Get that out of there. And technically, he wasn't a friend of mine because he's been dead a long time. Um, However, we want you to become friends with Jeremiah. I want you to be familiar with the book, um, not only to see how did God interact with Jeremiah, who is Jeremiah, because he's a real, was a real living person like you and me, right? Um, And then also, 
a little bit of a picture of who God is. How do you see God as a result of studying the book of Jeremiah? So let's get a couple of things right out there to help line up where we're at. We actually spent the last two weeks in the book of Ezekiel. So if you look on the timeline, this is after Jeremiah. And in the book of Ezekiel, they were actually living under that terrible Babylonian empire. So what Jeremiah is going to foretell and prophesy, we studied for two weeks, was already happening. And you say, well, why didn't you go in order? Well, it doesn't matter because the fact is it's a constant pattern. Israel follows God, falls away from God. There comes all kinds of doom. Follow God, fall away, and on and on it goes. We see it happening even after they were told They're put in exile, and they continue to follow their patterns. So we're going to back up to the book of Jeremiah now and start to look at what is coming that Ezekiel was speaking of. Also, there's a new one here called the fall of Israel. It gets a little confusing, uh, so we want to make sure you understand a little bit what happened in 722 B.C. So after Solomon died, King Solomon, they broke the, the whole Israelite community into two main kingdoms. The northern kingdom was referred to as Israel and the southern kingdom called Judah. And so that's made up of two tribes, Benjamin and Judah. So you'll hear this constant referring of the Israelites. Yes, they're Israelites, but they're in the kingdom of Judah. So in the book of Jeremiah, it's constantly referring to Judah um, because this northern kingdom is already taken captive and they're under the rule of Assyrians and other people. So hopefully that helps a little bit in our dialogue. If you hear Israel, we are still talking about the Israelites. Uh, A couple terms to help us out too. We're going to talk about the word repentance. That'll come up throughout. Um, Just putting it out there, this idea of repentance is to have sincere regret or remorse to the point where it actually affects what you do where you come to God and you say, I am very sorry for what I've done. And then because of that, I'm going to turn and do something new, something different. So that's really the heart of repentance. And then, of course, forsake, kind of a word that we read here is to abandon, to desert, um, or just to leave. This idea of here's God. I'm going to abandon what he, who he is or what he has for me. I'm going to leave that. I'm going to forsake it. So those are some words that are just going to come up we want you familiar with. And so who is this Jeremiah fella? Well, he's been referred to as the weeping prophet, right? And so uh, in, if you want to get your books ready, by the way, if you haven't picked up on this, we're in the book of Jeremiah the whole time. So uh, that's where you're going to be. But in chapter 9, listen to what he says. He says, oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. If your head were a fountain and you were weeping constantly, that would give you a pretty good title of the weeping prophet. So um, he's very brokenhearted for what he has to do, the call that God is going to give him that we're going to talk about. Um, And in addition to that, I think not only is he broken for his people, but I think he's broken for the fact that the job he has to do, I think I'd be crying too. You see, this isn't a one shot in the arm, I'm going to go tell everybody and then walk away. This is a 40-year mission that God's calling him to. Some of you aren't 40 yet, and some of you look at that and go, it's a long ways out there, and some of you are double 40, and you know what it's like. So it's a long time. It's a long time out there. Um, One last piece as we talk about Jeremiah. Some people, when they read, they want to read it like a story. Once upon a time, a bunch of stuff happens, the end, and that is not the layout of this book. So this kind of gives a little picture. Across the top are the dates as you walk through the book. The bottom are the chapters, and the lines indicate that chapter 21 is talked about here, and there's that time, and so it's all over the map because it's a collection of his thoughts, his prophecies, his conversations with God and God speaking to him, and him telling what he had to go and share and do. So if you're looking for like a a story, a bedtime story, it's going to be a little challenging because we're all over the place. You have dates of things happening that you go, where am I at in the story? It's a little confusing, but we're going to do our best to sort of break that open today. So if you want to open up to chapter 1, we're going to start there, and we're going to take a look specifically at Jeremiah himself. What did God say to Jeremiah? And it starts off like this. In verse 4, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. 
Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I don't know how to speak. I am too young. And then look at the Lord's response. But the Lord said to me, do not say I am too young. I'll use the dad's voice. Don't say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. So if we pause right here, we have an important dialogue that's happening. First of all, um, there is a clear statement that shows up time and time again throughout Scripture. God says, "Before before you were formed, I knew you. Before you were ever a twinkle in the eye, I knew you and I set you apart and I had a plan for you. And I was sad back in the youth ministry days when I did surveys with students and I would ask this question, when is a, when is a baby a human? And oftentimes 90% of the responses were once it leaves the mother. Until then, it's not a human. I think God has a different picture than that and I think we should have that picture. It says this is something that God knows. And by the way, he knows you. And he knew you before and he knows what your plans are. And it's a beautiful picture of a God who intimately knows, not a God who's out there and disconnected. So one, God knew him and he knows you. And secondly, this response is great, right? The human response. I don't know how to speak. I think he picked that up from Moses. And I am too young. Two great excuses. You could insert whatever you want. I don't know the language or I'm too old. Whatever you think it fits. But he has this this excuse. And God would say to you and to me, "Um, I'm not really worried about your age. Remember Moses? He was like in his 80s. Now how old is Jeremiah? Basically somewhere around 17 to 22 years old. So let's go with the youngest. Hey, 17-year-old, I got a job for you. (laughs) You're going to go tell the nations some really awesome news. They already know it's coming because I've been telling them for years and years, but we're going to give you some information. And so the teenage response is, I'm too young. And so I want to speak to those of you under 25 for a moment. Oftentimes in our youth, I believe what we do is we come up with this statement. I will follow God more fully when, and you fill in the blank, once I've finished college, when I have a better paycheck, once I know more of the Bible, blah, fill in the blank. And the fact is, the body of Christ needs all of us at all ages, all the time. And so those of you who are a little older in years, more seasoned in wisdom, perhaps you've set the pack down that God has given you And I would say to you, don't look to the young to do what you're called to do either. In fact, there are many that are desiring wisdom to be shared. There are many youth, many young who would say, if only someone would teach me. And I hope that for those of you who are down the road a little further, that you would take that to heart and say, wow, who am I investing in? Because this age isn't an issue. God says, it's not about your age and it's not about your abilities, by the way. In fact, if you come to God and say, I've got a plan about how you can use me, he's probably going to say, as soon as I can humble you, then I can use you. Right? It's not about your abilities. What God's interested in is your heart. He wants to know your heart. And so we look at something I think it's important. God speaks directly to Jeremiah here and he says, look, I knew you. I had a plan for you. There's a lot going on. But then he says this in verse 8. He says, this is great, by the way, if ever God says to you, don't be afraid, Okay, get ready. He says, do not be afraid of them, for I'm with you, good news, and I will rescue you. Oh, no, declares the Lord. I have to be rescued from something? Mm." But he says this, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations, teenager, and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow And then God in his mercy and his grace says to build and to plant. There's stuff coming. It's not great. It's not good. But guess what? I have a plan. And there will be a rebuilding. So take hope. And by the way, Jeremiah, I am going to have to rescue you. This is not an easy journey. What I'm going to call you to, people are going to hate you. And I think Jesus would say the same to us. If we're a follower of Jesus, people are not going to like what you have to say. 
until they get truth. And so God calls people. God calls us too, just like he called Jeremiah. I love what Ephesians says, that you are created by God, his handiwork, right? In Christ Jesus to do good works, prepare, that we're prepared in advance for you to do. Before you were born, God said, I have good works for you. If only you would come to me and allow me to help you to fulfill those good works. And so sometimes people ask like the simple question, well, how do I know what my role is? What is my plan? What has God laid out for me? And I'll give you just two ideas. You might write this down. Two things. The first one is do everything you already know. If you're not doing it by now, maybe that's a good place to start. Well, what do you mean? How about prayer? How about reading your Bible? How about serving either in the church, out the church, your neighbor, your friends, whatever? How about witnessing and sharing your faith and not hiding behind things? See, I think God would say, I have a great plan for you, but if you can't do the basics, how can I get you into the next level? And so the second piece would be, this is the hardest, by the way, for me. I'll only speak about myself, but he says, why don't you ask God? Have you ever thought of that? Hey, God, what do you have for me? What are the good works that you have for me? And then the hardest follow-up to an ask is to listen. Yeah, just listen. Listen in his word as he speaks to you. Listen as he talks to you through friends, through other believers, through people who perhaps are discipling you. See what God would do, and then go try some things and find out. Because you may think, oh man, I've been called to this ministry, and then you do it for a while, and you're like, wow, I guess that's not my gifting. But I still served. Let's try this one. Maybe it is worship after all. I've been playing the guitar for 50 years. Maybe I should go try it again, right? Maybe that is a gift that God has given me. The fact is that with God's calling comes God's gifting. With his calling comes his gifting. It's not the other way around. With his calling comes his gifting. Well, on your notes, for those who are note takers, you're gonna already going to be flipping out, some of you, because this word was changed. Sorry, I made a change. It was Friday. I wanted to do something different. I got to realize that on your notes it says Israel right here. And because he's speaking to Judah, I wanted to make it clear. So if you want to cross it out, feel free. If you can ignore it, let's move on. But here's uh, something I want to share with you. If you go to the book of 2 Kings, you might write that down for later. In the book of 2 Kings, there's something important that's happening. See, Jeremiah is now going to go out and begin to tell the people in Judah what's going on and what's coming. So they were going to the temple at this time. The temple in the book of 2 Kings, we find out that King Josiah was in charge of helping fix it up again. It had kind of gotten disrepair. He fixes it up, and now everybody's coming to the temple again. But in the process of the restoration of the temple, they find the Torah. And so King Josiah reads the Torah, and he's absolutely heartbroken because he reads what God's rules were for the covenant people, and he sees what they're actually doing, and he is disgusted and he tears his clothes and he tells everybody look we need to go into mourning we need to start to live right and follow God's covenant again his plan for us and so we move on down the road and they're still coming to the temple and look at what happens here as Jeremiah in chapter 7 if you want to flip there really quick look at what is said here it says this is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord so he says stand at the gate of the Lord's house the temple And there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions, and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, If you do not oppress the foreigners, the fatherless or the widows, and do not shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I gave your ancestors forever and ever. But look, you're trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury? 
burn incense to Baal and follow other gods you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we're safe, safe to do all these detestable things. Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I've been watching you, declares the Lord. I've been watching These are harsh words, and this is on and on. Jeremiah will continue to lay this out for many chapters to bring awareness and clarity. And look at, first of all, the beauty of God's grace. If you followed along, it said very clearly, if you will change your ways, I will let you live in this place. If you will follow my commandments, I'll let you live in this place. If you'll do this, we don't have to go down this road. There's an easier way like raising teenagers, right? There's an, if you just listen, I've done this before, son. No, dad, you don't know. It's different today, yeah. right? You don't know. But here's what's happening. This is what's important. I'm going to back up here for a second because there's this statement. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, <coughs> the temple of the Lord. <clears throat> Something that had been happening is that basically... People got to a point where they believed the temple was a great place to go despite what you were doing, and if I came to the temple, it could be like a charm to help cover me, a charm that perhaps would, if I show up to attend the service but don't actually live in service, that God would look past all the things I'm doing. And so let's get real clear what God is talking about here. One of the key things that's going on is idol worship. Sound familiar from the book of Ezekiel? They haven't stopped. Idol worship was going on. This this kind of represents this idea of this metal statue, and these guys in the corner, they're feeding fire into this hot statue. They're heating it up, glowing red, and you can see them placing their children on that idol. So this was a practice of perhaps to get more uh, a more productive crop or somehow to please the gods in your work or perhaps to heal somebody. We see that in Cambodia. And then they would go from there and listen to what it says, first of all, in chapter 19. This is God who says, they have built the high places of Baal to burn their children in the fire as offerings to Baal, something I did not command or mention, nor did it enter my mind. This is all on their own. I don't have any way of of moving them in this direction. That is so far from my heart. And they're going and doing this, and then they come to my house and act like, I'm safe, it's all good. It's all good. God, I'm doing the service stuff, so I'm here. And I have to ask ourselves that same question. Although the book of Jeremiah was not written to you specifically, you were not in the tribe of Judah or in the Benjamin or Israel at that time, there are truths that carry to us today. And I think we have to ask the real question, am I doing the same thing? Am I living for myself, for the flesh, for the world, and then coming perhaps on a weekend hoping that God will look past everything that I've done? And I can walk out feeling good, but not really changing. I think that's the message of what's happening. And I think the fact is that we're all capable of forsaking God. In our flesh, it's easy. So I thought I'd I'd make it a little personal. And I I had to one-up Pastor Will a little bit. So he brings some little bobblehead. I mean, what kind of idol is that? Good grief. So I brought something bigger, right? (laughs) Right? This is my small net. I have a bigger one, but, but I thought, here's an idol. It's not an idol like we see here. Like, honestly, it's not, it's not as obvious. If I stopped by to fish on the way to church, it'd be a little different than going by and sacrificing a child on the way to church. But the funny thing about fishing for me or whatever, you can insert whatever it is for you. I bet you right now you can think of those things that perhaps can take time. And I start to think about, by itself, it wasn't an idol. And so I've been in a process of my life trying to to work through this whole piece. And I I would never say to you, I never sacrificed my children at the altar of fishing. And then I start to ask myself, did I 
Maybe I have. Not in this way. Not a physical lay it down and watch my child die, but how many times have perhaps in my life are the things that take my attention direct me away from caring for my family, direct me away from worshiping God, direct my finances away from investment in the kingdom? See, it's a real tricky thing. Fishing in itself is fine. It feeds my family. It's enjoyable. God's blessed us with this great creation we get to enjoy. And yet it can become that idol, that thing that at one point I can remember saying, oh, I'd love to go to church today, but the fish are biting. Oh, I'd love to help that neighbor, but the fish are running right now. And if you're at all a fisherman or know anything, the fish run year-round here in the Umqua. So it's kind of a blessing and a curse all at the same time. So I challenge you to think about what is it in your life, perhaps, what would you place on the, the idol mantle and say, ooh, that is in danger of becoming more important to me than the very God who saved me. What do I need to do? How do I... How do I adjust that? And, and we want to carry this idea. Back then in Jeremiah's time and our time today, God wants to be known. And that is our job as followers of Jesus to make Him known. God wants to be heard through His Word and through the life song of His followers. Hopefully you sing a beautiful life song, right? When you walk into the room, people go, what, what is going on? There is something brilliant about that person the way they handle things the way they talk the way they love and finally God wants to and I will add needs to be honored but he wants to be honored well Jeremiah gets the task he says all right you put your words in my mouth I'm going to spend 40 years I will cry continually because it's painful I have to see the destruction. I'm going to live through this, God? He's like, yep, you're going to get to live through the destruction of everything that you're going to tell them. And listen to what, in chapter 25, we've had 20-some chapters of this. This is a summary chapter. It kind of brings a few pieces together. Chapter 25 says, Therefore the Lord Almighty says this, Because you have not listened to my words. Okay, Jeremiah has been telling and telling, but they're not listening. Verse 9, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. The 70 years is an important number that comes very specifically out of this prophecy from Jeremiah. And in your devotions, you're welcome to do that this week. I tried to give you a few connections to go, why 70? How does that link and where is it at? And you'll have to do some more homework because it would probably take us four or five weeks just to get that study out of the way. And they said, hey, Craig, you have two weeks. Let's do this. Right on. 52 chapters. I'm halfway there. Here we go. Important thing happens, though. God says this is what's going to happen. Because you won't listen, here's what's happening. Because you won't listen, and on and on it goes. And he says 70 years. But see, there's something else that God loves to do. He adds this three-letter word in, in his word. B-U-T. 70 years is coming, but when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon for, and his nation. The land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it a desolate forever. Yes, the Babylonians are going to have the ability to come and overrun you. And how many times in life have you seen what you would categorize as people worse than you? That's easy to do. People who are worse than you seem to get everything. People that are just living for the world, you're like, why are they blessed so much? I feel like they get everything they deserve and want and... And I follow God and I just don't feel like I get that. Well, because you've been saved and you have an award, a reward already there. You are free. And so one of the things that I believe we need to see here is that God says, look, vengeance is mine. Yes, I'm going to use the Babylonians. It's going to happen. But don't worry. They've got their own problems. I'll take care of them. 
Maybe if we worried less about what everybody else was doing and worried more about what we're doing, we might be better off, right? And so we go through this, and this really cool, uh, this is the most, probably one of the most misquoted pieces of Scripture because we apply it out of context. So I'm going to give you the context. Here it is. And chapter 29 says, this is what the Lord says, when 70 years are complete for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. That is specific to this time. When you come out of the 70 years, I know the plans I have for you. There is hope. Don't worry. You didn't lose me. You just got shooken up a little bit. And so we'll take this and we'll pull it out and we'll say, this is what God is saying to you right now. And, and there's truth in it. God does have a plan for you. He does want to prosper you, but I'm afraid sometimes that word gets applied to the financial blessing rather than the eternal blessing. I've been prospered for eternity once I come into salvation. No matter what my illness, no matter what harm comes to me, my eternity is set. That's a pretty prosperous plan. I'll take it, right? It's a good thing. So God would say this to us, but, but now that you can go back and go, oh, that's where that comes from. That's actually to the people who are going to be under the Babylonian stuff for 70 years, and God's giving them hope, right? But I think I wanted to to conclude with something out of the New Testament that is just, I thought was so cool as I was doing my study. And uh, we're going to spend next week really looking at Jeremiah's role in the prophecy of the coming Messiah. Because he has a big piece to play in foretelling that Jesus would come. So look what it says in Acts, or in Acts chapter 3. It says this, repent then, we'll apply that to the Judah, as well as us, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore all things, as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. So in the writing, Jesus had left the scene now, and we're talking about, in Book of Acts, we see the, the church exploding. It's awesome, right? But there's this reminder to the Jews of that day. Remember the prophets? Jeremiah was one of them. He talked about Jesus. And we're going to spend some time next week doing that, but I want to leave with this hope. There's heaviness and reality. God is out there saying, look, please, listen, listen to me. I have a plan for you. Listen to me. I have hope for you. Listen to me. And he says this, though, that God will restore all things. I think we need to get that picture. Sometimes we want restoration of all things today. And now that'd be great. I'd love that. (laughs) But he says, unfortunately, some people are going to have to go through some hard times before they listen to me. Unfortunately, they're going to have to struggle before they'll respond to me. And so the world continues to spin. But there's hope. God will restore all things. I'm going to release to our campuses. Love you guys. See you soon. Enjoy your time. I can't think of a better way to end than to really reflect on the picture of communion because we're going to celebrate communion, this reminder of the coming Messiah who came as well as the Messiah who will return. See, we're told very clearly in Scripture that when we take the bread, and Jesus says, this is my body, and the juice, and he says, this is my blood, and he says, when you eat and drink these, do this in remembrance of me. We're not only remembering who he was, what he did, and what he fulfilled, all the prophecies, but we're also reminding ourselves and the world that he's coming again that he's not done. So I want you to take a minute. I want you to examine your heart. I want you to think, as you think about what the Israelites were doing and their idol worship and perhaps how they were living, I think this is an important time to examine your heart. How are you doing? Does your heart beat with God's heart? Does it line up? What about your motivations and your actions? 
I'm grateful you're here, and I hope you continue to come and worship and and build your relationship with God and make disciples. But if you're coming with the the idea that it's a magic charm, that somehow God will overlook last week because you came, I'd like you to just evaluate your actions, your motivation for coming, your motivation for giving, your motivations for serving, all of it, to say, am I doing this because of of reverence for God that I want to lift Him up with my life, or am I doing it with the hope that He'll see what I've done and and then shine his face upon me despite what I'm doing. Get it all together. All together. together. That's right. Get it together. You ready? I know you're ready. It's important. So what I'm going to do is we're going to, I'm going to pray for you in a minute. I'm going to give you some time to reflect, to ask God maybe today, God, how am I doing? Perhaps you need to confess some things to God at this time. And then we'll have you come up and grab the cracker and the juice, and you'll take those back to your seat. And I'm going to ask you to hold on to those if you're down here, and up there they'll serve to you. And if you'll hold those, let's eat and drink together today. We'll kind of do that and celebrate and remember. But I do want to remind you that if you're not a believer, please don't do this. You see, when we do this, we are proclaiming that Jesus came and will come again. We are proclaiming that salvation is here. And please don't do that out of uh, any kind of like pressure because I believe that the Scripture is clear. You've, you're hearing about the gospel, and boy, I'll tell you, we want to take this serious. This is, uh, as a follower of Jesus, this is what I do to say, I trust you. You are my Lord. You are my Savior, and I want to give you everything that I can give. So let me pray for you, and then I'll have you come up and grab your elements. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much. What a joy that we can come in this place today. We are free to worship you. For the days you give us of freedom in this country, God, we lift up your name. And when it perhaps becomes more difficult, we will lift up your name. God, help us as we uh, reflect on the gift of salvation through the blood and body of Christ, God. Help us to remember. Help us to give gratitude from our hearts. Help us to know truth and give us a picture of you, Father. We love you and we give this time to you in your precious and holy name. Amen. Would you come on up and you can grab some elements and we'll uh, spend some time together. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able, or wherever you might be. And... I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is, and and, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person. So this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, After supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to again review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And, and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, So then, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming and they were hungry and they were elbowing their way in and they were getting a lot and it, it turned into a... a a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, I confess, I, I blow it all the time. I'm, I'm a sinful person. And thank you, God, for forgiving me. And, and, and you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and, and kind of like clear the plate. And I, I think it's impor important for us to do that daily, but it seems like when we celebrate communion, there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying, okay, I want to clear my heart. And then, and then he says, we are to remember the body and blood of Christ. And I, and I think as you go through and as you take that bread, you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns and and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it but but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him this this is a free gift for me but wow the cost was incredible and 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 when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me that that's the only way that sin is forgiven and in the old testament it was a lamb that was killed and the the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar and that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you, you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I... I remember you, I take this, and you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer and um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then, and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online and and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that, that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering, reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and, and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this 
the symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that and we'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today.